and then I'll just pass it to you. I'll just introduce your yeah. name and then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi, we're here through Hera's Green Stitch Program with David Gregg, and he's going to talk to us about biodiversity in Wakefield. So, okay. there you go. Yep. Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, I'm David Gregg. I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. And uh, if you're not familiar with the Natural History Survey, a lot of states have natural history surveys. Rhode Island is the only state where the Natural History Survey is not an arm of the state government. We're a nonprofit. Usually they are associated with the univer a state university or with the state environmental managers uh, uh, agency. Um, <clears throat> Rhode Island has a nonprofit uh, 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 natural history survey because we have a, w a small government and a well-educated population, so it makes sense to engage the people in their own interests to to document the biodiversity in the state and that's what natural history surveys have done since the 19th century is to record and and survey literally the natural resources in a state for conservation and for exploitation um, so uh, the, the the subject of the talk is kind of inherent in what i just said survey the biodiversity of the state. And so what I wanted to talk about was, what is this biodiversity anyway? I mean, <clears throat> we throw this word around all the time now. We want, we want lots of it, whatever it is. Um, and so I thought it'd be good to talk a little bit about that. And then <clears throat> we can go from that and we'll take some nets and stuff and we'll just go see what we can find around here. And we'll talk about what it tells us about where we are. So, um, so first of all, biodiversity um, has a lot of different meanings. So <clears throat> commonly, people think it means lots of different species. So <clears throat> where, where, where are the kids? Hey, kids, come, up, come a little closer. So, so when I say, when I say, come, come on up here. So when I say species, a species of animal or plant, what do I mean? Right, some kind, right? Some, yep. Like, <clears throat> bird is bird a species? Is it? Right. A species is one kind of bird. So a bird is actually a hot, a larger grouping, like mammal, right? Or clam. There's lots of different kinds of mammals, right? So they're different species. So one of the meanings of biodiversity is just lots of species. And a species is a kind of animal that when a, a, a male and female mate, their offspring are the same as their parents. So that's a species. Um, but biodiversity can also mean genetic diversity. So if you have one red-winged blackbird, it, it's only got the genes that it carries. But if you have a thousand red-winged blackbirds, you have actually a lot of genetic diversity within those. So you actually could say that a large group of the same species is, has more biodiversity than one example of the same species. So, and then there's also community biodiversity. So if you have uh, lots of different natural communities, you have lots of biodiversity. Uh, you could have a, so we're looking at a lawn. So lawn is one kind of natural community. Is it very biodiverse? Is there a lot of biodiversity in a lawn? No. It, okay. Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's a little more here than some lawns, but still not that much. Um, but this lawn is next to, what's that over there? A lake, right. What kind of lake? Does this lake just sit there or does it flow from one end to the other? It flows. This is a river, but it's a wide spot in a river. And there's kinds of animals that will only live there. They won't live up there or down there. And they definitely won't live here. So these two are close. And what about all these trees, all the woods? There's another community. So, and there's some like dirt over there. Dirt, a bi just bare dirt is actually has its own group of animals that only live in bare dirt. There's a nice patch of it over there. 
So actually, the, from a certain point of view, this location has some biodiversity. It's got lawn and bushes and it's got a river and some dirt. It's actually not bad from that point of view. Okay, so that's different kinds of diversity. And so then the question is how diverse do we, like let's say we wanted to survey the biodiversity, how diverse do we think this really is? Okay, so now I'm gonna ask, here's the, the quiz, like how many, let's say, how many different kinds of butterflies do you think there are in Rhode Island? Anybody, just guesses. How many kinds of butterflies in Rhode Island? Five. 25? A th you think a thousand? Hmm. 250? <clears throat> the answer is right around a hundred. Maybe a little less. So, <clears throat> it, the most diverse place of, for butterflies in Rhode Island could theoretically be a hundred different kinds of butterflies, but obviously they're specialized to different things, so they don't, you're not gonna get all hundred in any one place. All right, well, how about birds. How many different kinds of birds are there in Rhode Island? Anybody? How many kinds of birds? It's not as big as a thousand, I'll tell you that. Anybody? How 1,500. 1,500? All right, hang on to that. How many? Nope. All right. It's somewhere between 120 and 400. I, I would say it, if you exclude all the like ultra rare ones that only show up once a generation, it might be 275, 250, 275. So it's twice as, it's more than twice as diverse as the butterflies. Okay, but how many kinds of vascular plants are there in Rhode Island? Vascular plants. So those are plants that have stems and, and they have water sap that flows through them as opposed to moss and like green goo that you find in water. How many kinds of plants are there? 5,000. How many? Um, um, I, told, I, I, I told you to remember a number a second ago. What number did I tell you to remember? 1,500? Yeah, did you have a guess? Yeah, 1,500. Right, it's, it's, it's give or take, it's, it's 1,500 give or take 100 or so. Um, so that's, that's, whatever it is, it's eight times more diverse than the birds. What about moths? Um, 500. Oh, that's actually not a bad guess. I would say it's a little bigger than 500, but that's about the right ballpark. And we actually don't know because there's so many and nobody's ever counted them all. All right, so, yeah, yeah. Um, butterflies and moths together form a single group of Lepidoptera and then it splits between butterflies and moths. So now, when we're thinking about biodiversity and we talk, we're talking about communities, so each community, natural community, has organisms that are unique to it, right? So think about it. If there are, let's say there are 800 moth, moths in Rhode Island, how many different moth habitats are there in Rhode Island? Yeah, darn close to 800, right? <laughs> Because if, the, if there were only 400 different ways a moth could make a living, there'd only be 400 moths. So there's 800 different ways a moth can make a living in Rhode Island. All right, now, how many different kinds of bees and wasps are, they, are there? So bees and wasps go together in a single group called the Hymenoptera. How many different kinds of bees and wasps are there all together? Yeah. 15? Okay, 15, <laughs> yeah. How many? 40. 40, yeah. 56. Hmm. Well, you're all pretty far off. 700? You're far off too. There's probably, there's at least 3,000 species of bees and wasps in Rhode Island. And so, you can follow the logic, how many different habitats are there for bees and wasps in Rhode Island? a lot, <laughs> right? 
3,000. Now, so if you are interested in the health of the environment of Rhode Island, you wanted to get a really detailed picture of how Rhode Island is doing, which group of organisms should you survey? You want, theoretically, you want the most numerous you can get, right? Because they're very, sen it's very sensitive. The number of bees and wasps, they are in every nook and cranny, every conceivable combination of plant, animal, temperature, water, humid, all of that stuff. There's a wasp that only does that. And so you want to survey the most diverse thing you can survey. Now, I'll give you a hint. Nobody on the face of the earth can identify all the wasps that live in Rhode Island. So that's actually a pretty, that's maybe too diverse. Um, so you want the most diverse group that you can realistically survey. Um, and plants seems to be one that has been really good. Um, the plants stay put, so you can, you, can, you can survey them over a period of time. They don't move around. Uh, if, you, if you were to survey mammals, you know, there's one moose, but it might be hard to find and it might move around and so you can never find it consistently. Um, It was just one moose? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so th that's a little bit about, about wh what is biodiversity and why is it important? Why is it important to know what lives in Rhode Island and to have, and it, it's, you know, if you think about it, you want to survey the most numerous taxa, taxon you can possibly understand. So you actually, that's dependent on how good your naturalists are. And we have a really active wild plant community in Rhode Island, and that's actually really helped do, to do plants. Um, one of the problems with bees and wasps is they're extremely hard to tell apart, and only experts who can dissect their genitalia can actually tell them one from another. So it's not as, yeah, it's not as good. Um, but you know, some places that would make sense. If you if you were going to survey a small area and you had a lot of scientists and you really wanted the answer, that would be that would be a good one. Um, what is the right number of like an amount that's like capable of you're capable of studying? Yeah. Well? Yep. Well, that depends on a couple of things. Mostly how patient you are. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but that's, that's, a, that's actually, a, uh, that is a, a, a deceptively good question. How, how do you pick an, a group of organisms to learn? And you want to pick, you know, you don't want to pick a group that's so easy that you've got it in an afternoon, because what fun is that? Um, and you don't want to pick one that is so hard that nobody can ever figure it out. Or, and this is important, like let's say, I act, this is a real story. I decided at one point, I was cleaning out the bird boxes at my house, and I, one of the reasons you clean out bird boxes is to get out all the parasites that from the previous nest season. So I was thinking about fleas, and I knew that there are fleas that only live on birds. So I thought, wow, I bet in these nests there are these specialized fleas. I could, I could like get those and put them in my insect class. I could learn the fleas of Rhode Island, and I bet I'd be the only person, I'd be the only expert on the fleas of Rhode Island. Right, well, so remember, we want to know how many kinds of fleas there are in Rhode Island. There's probably 50 species of fleas in Rhode Island. So it's actually pretty diverse. There are a lot of fleas that only specialize in one kind of animal. So I was like, wow, that'd be really cool. So I, decided, I started looking into how you tell fleas apart. And the problem with this is that you have to, you have to use chemicals to clarify the flea. You have to cut a little slit in the side of the flea, let the chemicals go in, 
dissolve out its innards and then wash out the insides and then, and then um, basically bleach it so that it turns clear. And then you mount it on a microscope slide and look at it under a compound microscope to t and you look at the internal organs and the, the numbers of bumps on its chin and stuff like that. And I, I realized that, first of all, I didn't have the patience for that kind of nonsense. <laughs> and, you know, one, one reason to do this, to do this, you know, kind of collecting stuff is, is actually social. I mean, I was just out this morning with another butterfly collector friend of mine and we had a great time. And whether we found butterflies or not was kind of immaterial because we were having a good time. And so you want to be able to like, hey, look at my butterfly collection. <laughs> you can't be like, hey, look at my flea collection. It's like, it's like in a little microscope. By, oh, this is the best flea collection in Rhode Island. <laughs> you know, so it doesn't make any sense. Um, so, but that brings us to the next question, which is how do you tell species apart? And that has to do with the significant difference. So do you ever see the, um, the Bugs Bunny cartoon where the abominable snowman catches Daffy Duck and, and thinks that it's a rabbit? And, the, and Daffy Duck is, is like, I'm a duck, I'm a duck, I'm not a rabbit. And Bugs Bunny says to the abominable sm snowman, what are the distinguishing characteristics of a rabbit? And the, he goes, distinguishing characteristics. And he has, well, he has long gears. So like long ears, we've decided that that's important. That's, that's a way you tell fishers from rabbits, right? They have long ears. And somebody has figured out the significant difference between all of these different animals and plants to understand which ones go together in different groups. So one of the ways that I like to think about the significant difference, um, and, and it goes to, <laughs> We've we've had the we've had the the paving contractor and now we've got the coast guard. <laughs> yeah, noise diversity. There's actually there was a they, there was a study that said that found that songbirds have louder songs in suburban environments that have more noise. So, um, it, so the significant difference. One of the ways I think of significant difference is, and this goes back to the idea of how you decide what kind of naturalist you want to be, is what kind of net you need to catch something or how you go about gathering it because everything has its own kind of way of doing stuff. So I brought some nets. This is, what kind of net, what kind of net is this? What, what kind of net is this? Butterfly net, right? Do you ever see, like, the, there's a sort of a stereotype that, that people, crazy people go running through the fields, like waving butterfly nets around? I'll tell you, if you're chasing a butterfly through a field waving the net like this, you've already messed up. <laughs> you're supposed to get the butterfly before it gets really alarmed and flies off. All right, so, so but this, Look at all the holes in this net, right? So that's so air can go through it and you can swing fast, right? Then this one, the two different sizes, right? Uh, look, where's my other one? This one, that's gonna cause a problem. This one, this one has, see there's two different sizes, big and little, right? So the, the little one, I can swing faster um, and the big one is wider. So it's more likely to catch something it's easier to hit something with the wider one, but it goes slower. So there's two different trade-offs. This, if you were catching dragonflies, you might want this net because they are so fast and so agile that you need to be able to, they're ducking and dodging and you need to get them with the biggest net you got. Um, I like my little net because I can get butterflies off of plants without trashing the plant i can get in between stems and i can swish swish right so now this kind of net here this is called a sweep net and sweep nets are full of grass seeds sweep nets are for beetles and stuff like that like plant hoppers and what you do is see how it's it's solid cloth you just smash it through vegetation and beetles when they're startled just let go 
and because that's like normally there it's a bird that's trying to eat it right so startled it drops a bird it goes into the leaves the bird can't find it but you can use your net to to do that by startling it and it fall down the net and then you get to look at it now this kind of net anybody fish right or crayfish or dragonfly larvae or aquatic beetles any of that stuff right but it's it's big it's got bigger holes but it's stronger so you can really swish it around in the water really well all right now there's other things like binoculars binoculars have become really popular now um, for butterflies and dragonflies and a bunch of other things that used to get collected. Um, of course, how did Roger Torrey Peterson or, or John James Audubon start, as, start their knowledge of birds with a shotgun? So that was in the old days, people were bird collectors. We don't even think of that now. They're like, hey, what do you collect? I collect birds. Um, so... And for a long time, butterflies was a thing you collected. But now we have really good close focus binoculars and, bird, and uh, butterfly books that are written to emphasize things that you can see easily from, the, from a distance instead of things you have to look at under a microscope. And so we've come to be butterfly watchers instead of butterfly collectors. And the same thing with dragonflies now. Dragonflies are much more a thing you just watch. So you don't always even need a net. Um, now, I also have this here, which I thought would be fun to try out. And um, I'm going to make the effort to get this untangled so I can take my net off. Can I hold something for you? Uh, well, let's just... Uh, I think I need to just get this under here like that. All right, so... Take these off. Is there a hawk? Yeah. So, so who has, does anybody have any questions before we go off and I'll show you how this works? Do most of the things that you have to catch when they're small bugs, do they end up dying or can, they, can you let them go again? Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. Basically, um, a lot of be beetles, moths, um, ants all have to be under a microscope to be able to tell the species apart. So they usually end up dead, yeah. yeah. And they're so specialized, if you were to take a very small specialized beetle you know, home to look at it under a microscope, there's no point in letting it go in your backyard, even if you could, because whatever it eats is probably not there anywhere, anyway. So, yeah. So there are all kinds of tricks that people use to find things that are living around them. And so one of the things that this is, this is a sifter that you use to get things out of leaf litter. So let's come on over here and we'll, I'll show you how we do it. All right. There we are. We got everybody? All right. So what I do is, let's say you take, take this stuff. Let's throw it in there. All right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bio, different kind of biodiversity. And then you sift it like, you see a spider? Yeah, so you sift it like this. Okay. Now, here, everybody look. What do we got in there? Whoa. And right? That's a big spider. Yeah. Look at all this stuff oh, yeah. crawling. Huh? It's a pillow. Yeah, that's, that's a pillow. Yeah. That's a wolf. Look, look at this. There's something in here. So it looks like a centipede. Mm. <clears throat> a worm? Where? Oh, oh, there's this other beetle. Those, those are pill Ooh. bugs. What's crawling up the side over there? Hmm. It's a big spider? Yeah, a big yeah. spider. So did you have? Did you know there were so many different things in that leaf? They, like when you look at those leaves, did you think there was a lot in there? Look, there's a little tiny beetle, right there. See that little tiny beetle? Oh yeah, that is. A, it's a caterpillar. Moth, probably a moth larva. Yep. There's another one right there. There are a bunch of moth, uh, moth larvae that eat 
dried leaves. And what is this? Oops, I dropped it. <laughs> yeah. There are probably a million. A couple. Oh, look at that. Springtail. Oh, cool. Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Look, that's a it's, a, it's, it's a, a primitive insect. So, how many? So, what is an insect? An insect is an animal that is really small. What are its distinguishing characteristics? Uh, it, um, has it has more than four legs. Yeah. And it has eight legs, I think. And no, those are arachnids. Ding, ding, ding. Exactly. <laughs> So that's actually just, that's one of the differences between insects and spiders. Insects have six legs. They're called the hexapoda. Hex is six and poda and, is legs. And spiders are not insects, they're arachnids because they, they have eight legs. Eight legs, right. And they've got other stuff that's interesting about them. Right. So there are, and these are isopods. They have lots of legs. Well, they've probably, cup, they probably have a couple of dozen legs. So, so there are, so there are probably two or three dozen kinds of organisms in here. If we spend, we could spend the rest of the day <laughs> sorting little things out of this pile, right? So one of the things, so, but one of the things is it's really hard to tell. You need to be a specialist in each one of these things to sort them out. So you'd need, you'd need not, you'd each, I'd have to have, you know, 12 specialists here to look at just what I got out of there. But there are different ways. There are different ways to do this. You can. You want to do another one? You you can do another one if you want. Here, you want to do another one? Yeah, I'll, I'll dump this. You can do another one. Here, dump this. Dump this. All right. Go ahead. Fill it full of leaves from somewhere over there or over there. Ones that you think look good. All right. And I'm gonna get my sweep net. I'm gonna show you how the sweep net works too. That's really cool. Okay, so here's, so here is the sweep net. I'll, I'll, let, the, I'll let the leaf people finish their, with their leaves. The leaf people. The leaf people. So are this, the snow fleas that you see? They're fluff it up a little bit. All right, now shake it. You pick it up and shake it. it it's heavy. Can you do it together? Each take an end. Why don't, each, why don't you each take an end? One take one end and one take the other end. There you go. That's it. That's it. That's it. Go, go, go. Really hard. Shake it as hard as you can. That's it. Good. All right. Now put that on one side. What'd you get? Um, more moth larvae. Yup. And okay. There's some moth larvae there. That's an ant. There's an ant. Look at that. There's an ant. How many kinds of ants do we have? Um, two. At least two, right? Because there's a big one and a little one. Yeah. And those, um, those, um, a pile ants. Those two types of ants. Oh, what's this? You see the caterpillars? Is that a, is that a centipede? It's a, uh, is it, it might be another caterpillar. Whoops. Yeah, put it right, right here. Oh, it is. It's a centipede. Good, good call, you guys. They are related to spiders. Oh, here's another centipede. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Did not know that. Yep. They're the we in when we do bio blitz, which is where we tr we try to bring volunteer experts that that dream team of of 150 volunteer experts together, and we try to see how many kinds of animals and plants we can find in 24 hours in a certain in place. Yeah, and we always count spiders and centipedes together. They're the spiders and kin. So centipedes, millipedes. What uh, time of year do you do that? Oh, BioBlitz, normally we do it in June. This year, we had to cancel last year, and this year we'll be doing it in, I think, uh, first and second of October at the Mercy Woods Preserve in Cumberland. I'm an, you can, this is the first announcement of it. Oh, we, it looks like we just, or we're just settling it. It looks like it's gonna be Mercy then. Woods. It's the very, very northeast corner of the state, convent? right? Uh, but near the convent? Uh, north of the convent. North of the convent. Right okay. against the mass line. Okay, yeah. Yeah. You guys found a ton of stuff in there. That's awesome. It is a centipede. It is a centipede. Nice job.
Are, do, you know, do you know what the difference is between centipedes? Here's a significant difference question. What's the difference between centipedes and millipedes? Wow, you're good. Sure, that's about right, or a thousand. And how about centipedes? Yes, yeah, cent is like there's a hundred pennies in a dollar, and we call them cents. So centipede is a is a hundred legs, and centipedes have one pair of legs on each body segment, and millipedes have two pairs of legs on each body segment. That's the significant difference. Okay, so um, there's something on the other side I wanted to show you guys I found just by that bush over there. So let's walk over there. Um, do you guys want to bring, can you guys bring the sifter and its bucket? Dump out all the creatures back where they belong and then bring those along. Okay. We're gonna go over to the, by the, by the um, jungle gym over on the other side. Not much lives in mulch. Yeah. I know, that's why people put it there to try to stop things from living. It's not, it's a terrible idea. Yeah. But leaves are a good idea. Leaves are a great idea. Uh, only dist only distantly related to millipedes and centipedes. <laughs> yeah, they they evolved yeah. to have no legs, didn't they? To have like tiny, tiny, tiny legs. Well, no, or no legs. What's the, you mean, what's the one you could find the most of or yeah. most likely find? Um, the easiest, okay, that's a good question. What is the, what is the kind of animal that you're most likely to find Probably where? a bird. A what? A bird. A bird? Yeah. Well, a bird, yeah, maybe, but not, but probably not even a bird. What kind of animal can you find in the most places you're most likely to find? Well, insects, yes, but what kind of insect? Uh, ants. 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 Yeah. There are more ants than anything else. And not kinds of ants. There's probably only about 150 kinds of ants in Rhode Island. But there are a lot of ants. And that's what I wanted to show you. So come over here and look at this. And don't, yes, just, just stop right here. Come right up to here. You can come, you come up right to there. You probably can't really see. Look at this. No, no, look at this. Look at, don't, don't go any closer than that because you'll step on their tunnels. This is a whole colony of formica ants. See, look right there. There's the little black ones. They're actually big as ants go. See them walking around there? Sometimes you have to hold still in order to see stuff. Look at all over here. These leaves are full of little black of, of, of ants. You want them right there? I think they're trying to find food. That's well. And what's all the Someone dirt? Go down that tunnel. Yeah. What's with all the dirt? Their um, their home. Yeah, they they dig. They dig, and that's the dirt they've dug out. So there's tunnels that go all down and all around here. This is a big ant colony. Probably comes probably comes out like this right here. Yep. Yeah, I thought yeah, that's... like white, like, white here, probably. Pop, pop, probably, yeah. All right, I want to show you guys how a sweet net works. So we'll, I'll just show uh, you the microphone, fella. Uh, thank you. Here, I'll show you how a sweet net works. All right, so 
we're taking advantage of the natural reflexes of the animals that we're trying to find. So you come up to, you can do it two ways. You can just go like this through a bush like this, and, or you can kind of go and whack the bush like this. Now, of course, I picked a rose bush, which is probably not the best. All right. So let's see what we got. Yeah, we could we could do that. Yep. We could, don't worry. Let's hear. I'm just going to turn the net inside out. All right. Ready? I'm going to turn the net inside out. You, you just watch them as they come out. So what's in there? What do you see? Um, there's a lot of ants. Okay, what's this? That's a buck. A fly. Like a fly. Yeah, a couple of ants. And see, what's a fly? Some ants. Actually, do you recognize that ant? What's uh -huh. it? It's Was that, that the one from before? Yeah, it's from over there. It's uh -huh. <laughs> ermine, er, ermine trude. All right, so wait a minute. Hang on a sec. So wait a minute. When the ants were over there in the dirt, right, we knew that they were making their house. I just whacked these bushes and ants fell into my net. What's up with that? Oh, uh, because they will kill, because they will get to get leaves to bring back to their home. Well, these are not leaf cutter ants, but yeah, some ants do that. No, they were looking for insects to eat. Probably they were gathering food in the bush. So you see all the things you can learn by just looking around for your biodiversity. Now look at else, what else is in here. Look at this. What's that? This green thing on my finger, that thing right there. Oh, uh, that is... A leaf bug? Hmm, close enough, yeah. It's a, you know what an aphid is? That's an aphid. They suck the juice out of leaves. That's how they get by. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of different kinds, depending on what kind of plant it's on. There's actually quite a few here. Oh, but look at this. What's that? Uh, a spider? Yeah. And what, uh, is, that, is that alive? Yeah, that is too. It's a fly. A little tiny, tiny fly. Fruit fly? Mm, that might even be a wasp, a little tiny wasp. Or an aphid. So oh, there's more of them. There's more of those little green Right. Ones. So uh, the, la the last thing I wanted to say w about, about all of these different ways that you can look for things is that um, every time, I mean, as through the history of science and every time we get a new instrument for looking at things, we get more questions than we actually get answers. Um, when Galileo invented the telescope, suddenly a whole world opened up and we were like, whoa, now there's so much more we don't know. Um, and it's the same thing, like invent the microscope. And I feel it like I'm, uh, you know, be, what, I mean, I know about microscopes, but if I, were to, if I get a microscope, suddenly I'm thinking, oh, I might, you know, I could study the fleas. I could, you know, I could make microscope slides. And, or um, I read recently uh, there was a study. Somebody had taken a a special kind of flashlight and had used it to. Uh, it it makes it shines a very very deep blue light, just a little above ultraviolet. And they shone it on salamanders, and they found out that salamanders f are fluorescent. And so you find a new thing, you have a new tool, and suddenly you find a new thing. And so every time, you know, every gizmo, every weird thing, I actually have, I was gonna show you another gizmo. Every time you get a new gizmo, you discover new things and you find yourself able to explore something you couldn't before. You have a snorkel and mask you can explore. You have a, a big aquatic net you can explore. This, this is for um, collecting ants and teeny tiny beetles. So you suck on this, and it sucks them up this part here. And they go, they go in here. And so, well, there's a screen. Theoretically, there's a screen in there to stop them from going all the way up. Um, right. Well, because if, if you, it's really hard to catch ants. You could be like trying to pick it up and going squish, uh, squish, oh, geez, squish. So you have a sucker like this. Um, the other thing you can do is if you shake everything into a tray like this, you can use your sucker to suck them up out of the tray. You can also, um, you can go around with your sweep net and you can sweep and then 
you can suck like little teeny tiny beetles that you get a lot of the time you can suck out of the net with your sucker and then you can take this you put the top on the vial and take it home and now you can look at all those things so every time we invent every time we come up with some new gizmo and it's sort of it's almost like it's like what kind of among naturalists like who can macgyver the weirdest looking thing um to bring to bio blitz and um I, i've got i've done some some doozies in my time um but it's even it even is kind of fun it's uh sort of a creative exercise you once you have experience doing this you know what you want to look at or do but you were like oh if only i had you know a thing i mean i was sucking up ants and they kept the big fast ones kept crawling back out of the tube and i was like oh, that's crazy why don't they have like a little you know all these scientists are going around and they've got little They've got little twigs that they've whittled and they're sticking in the end of the tube. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. So I made one that has a little trigger and you pull the trigger and it opens a little door in the end of the tube. And so you, you suck the ants up and then you, you, it's spring loaded. So you let go and it goes tick, closed again. And then that lets me do things I couldn't do before. So anyway, so that's, so that's a kind of fun thing about being interested in the biodiversity around you. Um, you get to have all kinds of creative expressions um, as you explore it. And, and, the other, and the thing to remember, like I hope the lesson that you take away from this is that you don't have to go to the Amazon to explore biodiversity. We have been in what any self-respecting ecologist would say is a pretty lousy piece of ground. And there's literally hundreds of species here. It took us no time at all to find several dozen with a shaker and a piece of Tupperware. So no piece of land is a throwaway. Every piece of land has a lot in it if you have the right tools and the experience to look. So that's, that's the lesson of the day. <laughs> For bio blitz or, or for or just anything like it's like are you like trying to say like i did this for a week or a day and we found x number and then you do that again another time and, and then measure yep. it over time or is it just like this is good because it has x number or yeah that, or so there's there's a but that's, that's a good question there's a bunch of different ways that you um there's a bunch of different goals that you can have as you're enumerating biodiversity one is just to see how many you can find and that would be you know, people, and that people do that, sort of, you know, like I've got more kinds of ants than you do. Um, uh, and Rhode Island, I mean, the, the famous one for that is birders. So, how, you know, who's got the most birds in Rhode Island in this year? And actually, I'm trying to do that right now. I'm, I'm doing a big year and I'm keeping track on this website that has all these big time birders on it. And I'm working relatively hard for somebody who has a full time job. Um, on finding birds, and I've got a hundred and right around 130 birds since January 1st, and like the person who's leading is that is like 280 or something. I mean, it's just it's not even close. The next, you know, the next the next highest person above me is probably 20. It's 20 above me. So I'm learning a lot. Um, so you can do it that way. Um, the other thing is to look for you can look for rare, you know, certain rare species, and those. You particularly, you want to find ones that are called, um, that are indicator species or they're keystone species. So it's a species that has, that tells you that something is a particular thing. So let's say you find a ringed bog haunter dragonfly. That's a butter. that's a dragonfly that needs really clear, cool water and dark, you know, undisturbed woods. So if you find that, you find a very important clue about the condition of what's around you. So you're looking for just an indicator species or a species that used to be common and now it's rare. And so you want to still be able to find it. And you 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 find, you know, the last place that this particular dung beetle occurs in Rhode Island. This is actually a real case. This, there's a dung beetle that used to be common all around Rhode Island and it, for a long time it was thought only to be left on Block Island because it needs open fields and sandy soil and whatever. And we found one on Jamestown in one of the bio blitzes. And so it tells us like, oh, well, whatever it needs, 
you know, now we're getting a couple of different, if we found it in three other places, we would start, you know, like now we could triangulate on what does this bug need and why did it disappear? Because we'll be looking at the examples that are still left. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to score it. Um, there's ones where you want to say, like, let's say there's a, a moth that only lives in sand dunes. And, you know, so you want to know whether your sand dune is healthy or not. You can go there, and if it's got the moth, then it's a complete system, and you know it's probably functioning the way it's supposed to function. Um, so yeah, there's all different, all different kinds of ways to do it. So I thought you were going to ask about BioBlitz. So BioBlitz, the 24-hour effort by volunteers to count species. So we do make kind of a game out of it, just for fun. And um, we divide up into teams for different taxa. So there's the butterfly team, the moth team, the moss team, the, the vascular plant team. And everybody uh, tries. To, and then I, f I figured out what is the, what, how many of those occur in Rhode Island. So I want the team, the winner is like the team that gets closest, the highest, you know, as closest to 100% of the species that occur in Rhode Island. Now, obviously that doesn't really work because wherever the BioBlitz is might be particularly good for a certain taxon, but so whatever. Yeah, you don't want to be on the bee, or, well, or may, maybe if, but you'd have to concentrate on finding a really rare one so that you'd at least have bragging rights at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So we have we have we kind of make a game out of it, and it like I said, the the social aspect is critical. I mean, if and and in Rhode Island, uh, uh, the the spider expert in Rhode Island is a he works he's an optical engineer who works out of, outside of Boston. So the the most knowledgeable spider person in Rhode Island isn't in Rhode Island, and he doesn't work in that field. <laughs> so if we ever needed to know anything about the spiders of Rhode Island, we're completely dependent on him knowing that if he came to a B Rhode Island BioBlitz, he'd see his buddies and they'd be able to yuck it up and have a good time. That's, it's, a, no, it's no more complicated than that. You, you have to create an environment where people like to get together and share their, their knowledge, so, yeah. Is there a big difference in the species between like the north half of the state and the east side of the state? And the is it like very different? It's, as far as it, it is very different. I mean. Like I said, the more species there are in a taxon, the more different, you know, stations of life there are in the environment for them. So um, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a taxon with very, very few, very few, few species, uh, freshwater fish. There are very few freshwater fish in Rhode Island. And so you have eels practically everywhere. Eel is actually the most widespread fish in Rhode Island um, and but there are other taxa where they're mostly specialized and so a moth that eats um, Hudsonia um, which is a, a dune a dune plant you're only gonna find it in Goosewing Beach in Little Compton because that's the last place where Hudsonia occurs or a pitcher plant borer moth well it's only gonna be in you know a bog in westerly along the bank of the wood pocket tuck or something and and then you just have to know you know that's that's again where not where the knowledge of the folks is really what we rely on because they know like if you told you know if you said i absolutely have to have a ringed bog haunter by you know three o'clock tomorrow there's only like five people who could do it and <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a pretty unlikely example, but there are examples that could be like that, you know. Um, there's a good, I mean, a good, a good, like, case of that is, um, are actually bumblebees, which we've been hearing a lot about because they're pollinators. And, well, actually, uh, there's a ladybug that's in the same case. Um, every, the, the two bumblebees in particular that used to be, pretty, you know, relatively common, and they were so common that scientists didn't pay much attention to them you know it's kind of like oh yeah whatever until they were gone and then somebody was doing a study of the bumblebees and didn't get any of uh, bombus terricola and there's another one i can't remember what it is um and they're like wait a minute when was the last time somebody saw you know, it's kind of like, like when was the last time somebody saw the kids um <laughs> you know so uh, and there's a ladybug too. The the um, nine spotted ladybug used to be our common ladybug, and there was literally a scientist went to look for them. Like, 
you know, hey, let's get some, let's get some nine spotted ladybugs, and nobody could find them. They were gone. So, and that's like that's really scary because whatever their niche was, has their ecological niche was, has completely changed, and we don't know what else that niche did, right? So. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, like, luckily, you know, hopefully that niche wasn't important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they could get bumped out by an invasive, but the invasive might not form perform all of the functions that the original one did. It might it might occupy the niche, but not all of its niches. Yeah. So does that, does that give people the clue to kind of study the common stuff almost as much as the rare stuff? I, I mean, I'm, I make that argument and not everybody buys it, <laughs> but, um, you know, Before it's too late, I guess. yeah, I mean, you have, you know, obviously you have to prioritize. There's not enough money to do everything. Um, but again, if you, you know, you, so you focus on the rare and the ecologically, the keystone species that are really performing a vital ecological function. And, and then you just try to be savvy about getting the other stuff. Um, and it's and everything you know it's all on a, you know scales too so you know kids know the the common stuff and then experts know the rare stuff and if you if you bring kids to bioblitz and they get they meet older people who are really still excited about beetles it tells them that that's a, a, an okay thing to be interested in and then they'll spend the rest of their lives learning the beetles and you'll have a new beetle expert right you know, yeah <laughs> um, how would you rank the biodiversity in South Kingstown relative to the rest of the state? Mm. As far as our range, you know, from beech to yeah. Pitch pine to yeah. Lisa Moraine and Kettle Pond and yeah. all that. Um, well, South Kingstown is a big town right. geographically, so it gets special. It gets extra points for being big. Um, uh, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty good. South Kingstown has a lot of the state's best habitat for a bunch of things. I mean, Great Swamp, um, the, all the moraine, all the ponds in Matunic, um, the big fields and grasslands around Trustum. Um, uh, it is not very good on the things that, that you'd find in Foster or Gloucester, big forests, big, deep, dark, wet forests or el uh, places that are elevated and inland. So um, on the coast, we have warmer winters and cooler summers. And so <clears throat> there are species that need a cold winter, usually to freeze out a competitor. And those you get in you know, the forest in Foster. Um, so there's a whole category of stuff that's missing in South Kingstown, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, even, even if you, you know, sort of divide by its square miles, which is a large number. Yeah. What about over time? Is it better or worse or stable? Well, it's probably, it's probably more or less stable, but that doesn't mean we aren't at the edge of a cliff. Um, <laughs> we might have been going across a plateau for some time now, but there's, there's an edge. I mean, if you look at um, if you look at birds, for example, uh, I mean, the co coastal South Kingstown is a global birding hotspot, and it um, but it's it's based on salt marshes and mud flats and big fields, those big open fields, and. You know, we've saved most of the big open fields, but sea level's going to get all those coastal wetlands and, and might get the fields too. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, once, once a, like I say, there's a big field, you know, there are things that only live in big fields, bobolinks, meadowlarks, um, bo yeah, a bobolinks and, and, and barn owls, let's say. Once it gets down to a certain size, they're just gonna, you know, check out. And, and we don't, you know, somebody probably knows what that size is. I mean, it, for barn owls, we were already, it's, they're already pretty much gone. I don't think there are nesting barn owls. Um, if there are, they're one every now and then, not regular. 
Um, yeah. Next bio blitz. Yeah. Um, the next bio blitz we're pretty sure is going to be October first and second in um, Mercy Woods in Cumberland, which is north of the monastery. It's as far north in Cumberland as you can go. Mercy Mount School is right neck is part of that same piece of property. So it's um, a 250 acres were just purchased by the town of Cumberland, um, and the land trust there is small and doesn't have a huge capacity. And so we kind of wanted to bring the BioBlitz there so that they could like, get some kudos for the work they did to get that piece of land. I mean, most of the town is probably like, yeah, whatever, all right, we'll get you the woods, you know. But, but if we bring 150 people there to rave about the biodiversity, that'll really, like, you know, should help validate the investment. Um, so anyway, October 1st and 2nd, I'm pretty sure. Um, I think we're gonna do a basic, right now it looks like we'll do the full scale bio blitz. We were, we were talking about whether we would have to scale it back a little bit, but I think we'll, we might do the whole deal. So it's, it's 24 hours all night. The moth people are, and the bat people are up all night. By the time they go to bed, the birders are already out in the woods. I will say, a funny story about birding at bio blitz. Birding, a lot of people who don't know other taxes say, well, I'll put me on the bird team. I'm like, okay. There are some really good birders. And so, the, you know, here's bird watching at BioBlitz. You know, like, okay, ready, everybody, go. And the birder goes out, you know, goes out in the woods, goes, yep, yeah, uh -huh, this warbler, mm -hmm, okay, that wren, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. all right, 180. And then, you know, there's all these other people who come and they're like, I saw a chickadee. I'm like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but we've also had people come and be kind of, not really sure what to do, and so we said, "All right, you're on the you're on the lichen team." And so this person spent 24 hours trailing around after the lichen person, and ended up thinking lichen were the coolest things and wanting to learn more about them. So. I was going to ask you, like, what's the root space for inexpert people? Um, well, there's stuff like the the mammals. Well, there's two answers to that question. I mean, I there's. Uh, there's stuff that takes a lot of time and energy, like um, sorting moths and and setting mammal traps, like really setting mammal traps. But there's also, you know, I try to encourage people to be more creative and put more energy into their creativity. So mammals are really hard because, like, there there's probably a skunk every in every BioBlitz site. But we only have, somebody's only recorded one about a third of the time, which means that we're not very good at detecting skunk. So what we really need to do is we need to have somebody come and just try to find the skunk. Um, and, but there's all sorts of like, like I, there's a, something called a track board that nobody's ever tried at BioBlitz. I don't even know whether it would work, but what you do is you take a piece of plywood, half, like you take a half a sheet of plywood, you put a can, a can of cat food in the middle and you sprinkle all around the outside with flour and you come back in the morning and you see what kinds of footprints are in the flour and nobody's ever tried that i'm like come on people Wait, that's... you can bring in you will you will bring in like tricks to to track the bioblitz for, for to find stuff yeah oh heck yeah oh, I, I, was, I was just trying to be as natural oh as no no, okay. no no <laughs> No, we, we, you know, we, you could, you could put like hair traps, like little sticky bands on trees, and hope that like a bear rubs against it and leaves some like hair, or then, but then you'd have to have a microscope to tell bear hair from like some other kind of hair. But that's okay. Um, I mean, you, go around and gather scat, and then figure out what kind of scat it is. There's, you know, finding small mammals. There's, there's probably six or eight different little rodenty things. And we only ever find like two, so that's just because people aren't trying very hard. I think they need to try harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you did. Okay. So the other lesson is that if you, I would say, you don't have to know very many bees and wasps to be the expert on the bees and wasps of Rhode Island, because there isn't anybody. Like, if you could reliably do 
half the bumblebees and a handful of, of wasps, you would be the wasp expert at BioBlitz. I mean, and the same thing applies to a lot of things that you'd be surprised at. Um, that, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot more that can be done with spiders. I mean, we have had a spider expert come and he's very helpful for IDing them, but that takes a lot of time, which means he's not out there in the weeds trying to find more. Um, we, we don't have anybody who ever does the, the spider kin. So the, the roly-poly pill bugs, the centipedes, the millipedes, the, you know, all of that stuff. So, you know, that, nope, we, we don't have anybody who does the grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids, the orthoptera. You, you literally, you could identify like four grasshoppers and you'd be the expert. So I, people... That's what I'm getting at is like, how, how much of an expert on any particular thing do you have to be to participate? Well, you don't have to be, you don't have to be an expert on anything. I mean, we take anybody, um, and that is... is so it, you will find a job for anybody. Yeah. So if you don't know what you want to do, you can put down something that you're interested in, and we might try to hook you up with that team. But the nice thing about BioBlitz is that everybody's in one place, so you can jump around and see what everybody's doing. I mean, there's one team that comes that they don't do a tax on. They only they do um, leaf litter. They're called the litter bugs, and they spend the entire 24 hours trying to coax little things out of piles of leaves, like we did over there. And um, they get all kinds of stuff that nobody else ever gets. Basically, they just hand a pile of things to somebody who then sorts them. And... Well, no, they sort them. They get the pile, they sort, and then they try to ID it. And if, they'll, if they find stuff that they, they know there's another team for, like beetles, they'll hand them off, or ants. But nobody ever counts centipedes and nobody ever counts you know worms we don't have anybody who knows the worms and and there's actually like ways to like you can identify worms they have species <laughs> um anyway it's 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 a little bit like a potluck you know you you you, you eat whatever anybody brings so it's heavy on some things and light on yeah like everybody brought a shrimp <laughs> ring exactly yep so Anyway. Super. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>